one set of uh, the first set of announcements is about the homework three. It's uh, due next Tuesday, and it covers everything that we saw in class. And uh, there's a midterm in class on Thursday next week, so you'll have uh, whatever is the length of the class, hundred minutes or something, uh, no, eighty minutes, right? The class is eighty minutes, and uh, we'll cover uh, the the midterm will cover everything that we saw in class till uh, the end of today's lecture. Uh, with respect to the previous homeworks, uh, we'll post solutions for the theory parts on Canvas by tomorrow, hopefully end of day tomorrow. And uh, the grading is ongoing. Um, we will try to get you some sort of grades as soon as we can. Uh, any questions, any comments, any thoughts? Oh, and the other thing is uh, uh, in response to, I think, a question that came up last uh, at the end of at the beginning of last lecture um tuesday's class is going to be entirely a review so please come with questions um any thoughts that you may have or any uh things that you don't understand and we'll try to my goal for tuesday's class is i'll just kind of quickly summarize everything that we saw so far and if i hit a point that you have a question where you have a question you can uh, interrupt me and we'll go over that that's exactly what I'll, I'll post a, a document on canvas uh, so that you can just kind of go over it and be ready with questions that's that's exactly what i was going to do other questions questions on zoom Because if there are no, oh, there is a question. Uh, can you discuss how to calculate the margin? So, there's a, how do you calculate the margin for, oh, let me just use this. So, for a set of Boolean data, I'm going to show you um, an example that, okay, I'll show you an example that's kind of uh, easy. And unfortunately, I have to think hard about the question that's in your homework because. In my mind, the question in your homework is also easy. So I have to make sure that I don't show you the answer to that one. So imagine that you have the, the, the way to, uh, the, the formal way of calculating the margin involves actually solving an optimization problem. And I don't expect you to do that. In fact, uh, by sometime in the middle of the second half of the semester, we will actually uh, look at that optimization problem in, when we get to support vector machines. But for now, uh, in two dimensions, you can kind of stare at a data set and figure out the margin. Let me show you how. Imagine that you have a two-dimensional Boolean data set. So you have only four points in the data. So this is, uh, let's call this, you have two features, x1 and x2. And this is the point 0, 0, 1, 0. So you have these four points. And now let's say, that uh, we have the function f of x1 comma x2 is the function say it's equal to x2. Um, so it's a Boolean function, right? It's true or false whenever x2 is true or false. That means that this point is plus, this point is plus, uh, this is minus, and this is minus. Right. Now, first question, show of hands, is this data set linearly separable? Yes, how many people say yes? A sufficient number of you that, uh, um, oh, I see. So the, the question is not about what I'm doing. Uh, the question is about calculating the number of mistakes. I'll come to that uh, once I finish this. In this data set, if you want to calculate the margin, what you do is you basically try to find a separator that separates the data. Now this line could be, Anywhere, it could be anywhere in this area is a valid uh, separator. The margin of the data set is when this line would be farthest away from the data point. So somewhere in the middle. So in some sense at half here. And the margin of the data is simply the distance of the, the, the closest distance to any data point that you can find from this line with, that separates the positives and the negatives with the maximum gap in between. But that was not the question at all. Uh, the question was when you need to calculate the number of mistakes for a perceptron. Um, 
how do you calculate the margin? So let's so remember that the the perceptron uh, mistake bound is r square over gamma square, where gamma is the margin of a data set. So how do you now calculate the margin of a data set for a Boolean function? What you do is you um, in in a in some sense you kind of do exactly what I just did, but a bit more uh, imaginatively. Uh, so let me show you an example in three dimensions. Now imagine that you had a three dimensional Boolean function, and and I'm going to show you an example in three dimension and ask you to extrapolate that um, beyond that. So three dimensional Boolean function means that we need we have three axes and we have points lying on this sort of a cube uh, at the boundaries of a cube. And when we want to calculate the margin of this data set, let's say the, the function is uh, a conjunction. It is uh, x, let's say this is x1, x2, and x3. So imagine that the function is a conjunction x1 and x2. Now, if um, let's say x1 and I have to think about which one it is, is the easiest for me to draw here. Um, yeah, let's say it's x1, x2, and x3. Okay. Now, that means that the only point that is positive is this one here when all three of them are 1, 1, 1. And everything else is negative. To calculate the margin of such a data set, what you, can, what you need to think about is uh, the, the, the heuristic here is for Boolean functions, if the data set is linearly separable, so this is a plus and these are all minuses. Only the edges that connect the pluses and the minuses so these three edges have to be somehow sliced by the hyperplane because everything else is a minus. So we don't care. So any edge that connects a plus and a minus has to be sliced. And for the margin, that has to be sliced right in the middle. So you want an equation of a plane that goes through the midpoint of these three things. So, so you have three points and you need to find the equation of a plane. How do you find the equation of a plane using three points? In the same way, you find the equation of a line using two points. Uh, and you generalize that to um, as many dimensions there are. Um, I, want to, I want to kind of leave the answer right there uh, for you to kind of work it out and then come back with questions. Does that make sense? Is that okay? Any other questions about anything? Questions about homework two. And by the way, this is something that we did not actually explicitly cover in class. I just told you the definition of a margin and uh, left it as an exercise when we looked at the perceptron mistake bound to compute the mistake bound for conjunctions and disjunctions and such things. And uh, uh, you know, it's a good exercise to kind of think about data in high dimension. Other thoughts? Any questions about what this picture here, which is kind of a rough example, or other things related to margins or anything else? So on Tuesday, keep the questions coming because uh, you know that's the point of uh, Tuesday's lecture. Otherwise, I'm just going to be standing here waiting, and uh, I don't know who will feel more awkward, you or me. Um, but that's what's going to happen. So come with the questions, okay? Let's now go back to where we were. When we uh, in the in the previous lecture, we were looking at uh, back learning. We looked at the definition of back learnability. I just want to restate the definition. Um, so we have a concept class C, and uh, there's an instance set instance uh, set of instances X that uh, whose uh, where every example is. The, uh, think is has a dimensionality m. We have a learning algorithm L that explores the hypothesis space H to try to find a hidden function that belongs to the concept class. We call that entire concept class fact learnable by L using H if for 
any function inside the hypothesis class. It doesn't matter where, which function we are looking for. It, uh, it could be in some for some definition of difficulty, the most difficult function to learn. And for any distribution over the instance space, remember this distribution is essentially the one that is used to sample examples. Any distribution over the instance space, and once again, it might be the most difficult one. With the assumption that's not stated here that the distribution is fixed between, uh, you know, uh, at training time and in the future. Given uh, two parameters, epsilon and delta, which are small, ideally close to zero, uh, we say that the concept class is fact learnable if given m examples that are polynomial in these complexity parameters. If the if using these m examples that are sampled independently from this fixed distribution, the learning algorithm produces a classifier, a hypothesis H, that has a, a that whose error is less than epsilon, and it does so almost all the time. It does so one minus delta uh, with probability one minus delta. If this happens then we say that the uh, concept class is fact learnable. And uh, another, a very sort of a colloquial way of stating this is given, in, given a small enough number of examples, your learner will produce a classifier with small error and it will do so with high probability. Any questions about this definition before we continue to uh, Occam's razor? There's also another associated definition uh, called efficiently pack learnable if uh, all of this thing at the top holds plus the learning algorithm L is efficient. In other words, uh, it can succeed in the way defined here in a time that is only polynomial in the same complexity parameters. The complexity parameters here are one over epsilon, one over delta, and, and the size of the hypothesis space. This may seem way too abstract. Don't worry, we'll see some examples. Yes. Um, no, you don't get different definitions. So uh, what we will eventually uh, work on is some expression of the form. If we have M greater than some polynomial of one over epsilon and all that, if we have these many examples, then learning will succeed with high probability. That's the statement of fact learnability for every new concept class. And the, the only thing that needs to change here is what is that expression? What, what polynomial expression is that? So if the number of examples, if you have at least a polynomial number of examples, then you, you then learning will succeed. So if you want a very high confidence that learning will succeed, for instance, that means that if delta is going to be really, really small, then it's, I mean, I've only said polynomial, right? What we will find is that if the confidence, uh, if we require high confidence that learning will succeed, then we may have to give up um, our demand for high accuracy, or we may need a lot more data points. So these things kind of work against each other. If you need a perfect classifier or near perfect classifier, namely epsilon is, uh, that means epsilon is really small. And if you need very high uh, you know, uh, probability of getting such a classifier, then we'll see that the only way of doing that is if you have a lot of data. Now, uh, right in this definition, that, that sort of a contrast between epsilon and delta and the number of examples is hidden because I only say polynomial. I don't say what polynomial. Now, in the yes. Um, error, like, is error on, uh, yes, error is specifically defined as the generalization error. It's defined as the probability that a randomly chosen example will be misclassified. Other questions? And by the way, that definition of error is important uh, because that's something that we use to build up pretty much all of this theory. 
the fact that error is the probability that a randomly chosen example will be misclassified. So at the end of the last lecture, the, the other thing that we looked at towards the end was this formalization of Occam's razor. And uh, I was working through this uh, theorem that uh, I'm going to uh, continue again. Now, imagine that we have uh, a hypothesis. We don't care who produces the hypothesis. Could be a learning algorithm, or we're just considering some hypothesis space. It doesn't matter. But imagine that there is some hypothesis space. Sorry, not hypothesis, not a single one, but a set of functions. Did you have a question? Yeah, we're assuming that H contains C. For now, we, we assume that H contains C. Yes. There's a question on Zoom. Uh, if the classifier has error more than epsilon, would we say it is comparable or close to epsilon? No, we would say it is more than epsilon. So there is, uh, uh, we don't care about almost epsilon. We care about strictly less than epsilon error. If you want, uh, if your epsilon is uh, more, if your error is more than epsilon, that means your your error, the the uh, the bound has to be weaker. Okay, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so imagine that you have a hypothesis space, H, capital H. It's a set of functions. Now, suppose you have a training set containing M examples. And you find that, so, the, so the, the, the question that we want to ask here in this claim, in this part here, is could your hypothesis space contain a function that appears to be really good, namely, it appears to be so good that it perfectly agrees with M examples. So that's what I mean by consistently consistent with M examples. And yet that particular hypothesis is bad. By bad, I mean its error is more than epsilon. Now, why is that an interesting, why is the existence of such a function an interesting uh, thing? Because if such a hypothesis exists in capital H, then it's possible that your learning algorithm will be fooled. It's possible that your learning algorithm will look at the fact that it's consistent with M examples and decide this is the true function, right? So now the question, the, the, the goal of this claim is to see, is that a rare event or not? Is it, pos is it possible that there is some function in the set of functions your learner is considering that is consistent and yet bad so that it may end up fooling the learner. And the claim says, yeah, it's of course possible, but the probability that that happens is going to be less than this quantity here, the size of the hypothesis space times one minus epsilon power n. And the way to prove this claim is rather than considering the entire hypothesis space, let's say that there is this one function, little h, that is the, that's a bad hypothesis. What that means is its error is more than epsilon. Error is simply defined. Let me clear out some of this. Error is simply defined as the probability of f of x is not equal to h of x. And that is, this is more than epsilon. If that quantity is more than epsilon, then the probability that this classifier is consistent with any one example by accident is less than 1 minus epsilon. Right. Any questions still here or any questions about the claim? You don't have to worry about how the claim is proved. That's what we're going to do next. But uh, that's pretty much the rest of the slide. But uh, Questions about understanding the claim. Why is it an interesting claim? Or why is it that uh, this claim should, um, you know, this lemma should even exist? Yeah. I'm making the jump here when we go from one x to one minus b. Because I get that. From here to here? Yeah, because I get that we know that they should uh so so probability of f of x is not equal to let's write it the error is 
did I say the error is more than epsilon, right? That means the probability of f of x not equal to h of x is more than epsilon because that's the definition of the error. The error is simply defined as the probability that your uh, uh, true function f disagrees with that function that we are considering right now. Um, in fact, this quantity here, I should write it as error of h. Okay, but we also know that probability of f of x equal to h of x is exactly the same as 1 minus the probability of f of x not equal to h of x. Why? Because either these two things are equal or they are not. These are the only two events possible and they, these probabilities have to add up to 1. So that means I can plug this quantity in this inequality here. Right? So all I did is just notice that this, oh, wrong. What I did is wrong. So let's just make this right in the easiest possible way there. So I can say this is the probability that f of x is not equal to h of x is exactly the same as 1 minus the probability that they are equal, which means probability of f of x equals h of x is less than 1 minus epsilon. I just move the things around. Another way of saying this, another what this means is if your error is more than epsilon, then the probability that you are the, the classifier you are con currently considering, namely H, is accidentally equal to the truth. It produces this true label accidentally is less than 1 minus epsilon. Epsilon could be a small number. Epsilon is like 0 0.01, for example. That means this is, it's not saying much. This probability is less than 0.99. But still, it's not 1. It's not 100%. The, did that answer your question? Okay, other thoughts, other questions about this point. So what this means is that the, the, the this expression is simply saying the probability that a randomly chosen classifier, not sorry, a, a randomly chosen example is correctly labeled by this classifier H is less than one minus epsilon. Our training data consists of not one randomly chosen example, but m such example. And we know that the training, the, the uh, you know, the, the question that we are asking is that the hypothesis that whose existence we are contemplating, probability that there exists a hypothesis, is consistent with m example. So each example is chosen independently, which means the probability that this hypothesis is consistent with the first example is less than one minus epsilon, the probability is consistent with the second example is less than one minus epsilon. The third one is one less than one minus epsilon. Each one of them is independently uh, can be uh, consistent with the classifier with probability what less than one minus epsilon. So when you, uh, because you have m examples drawn independently, the probability that the hypothesis is consistent with all m of them just by chance is less than one minus epsilon power m. Any comments or questions till here? Also on Zoom. So what we have here is that the probability that one such bad hypothesis whose error is more than epsilon is accidentally consistent with the entirety of the training data that we have is going to be less than 1 minus epsilon power m. But we don't care about that one bad hypothesis. We want to know what's the probability there might exist at least one such hypothesis in the entirety of the data. And this all, for this, we need to say we can add up this quantity as many times as we have training points to get an upper bound. It, and that gives us the union bound. 
that, that uses the union bond. So the probability that there is some bad hypothesis that's consistent with all m examples is the number of hypotheses we have, namely the size of h, times 1 minus epsilon power m. And that proves the claim. This is where we stopped at the end of the last lecture. And I want to pause here for questions uh, because I've noticed that people tend to kind of see, feel that this proof is small, so it should be easy. But when you stare at it, it doesn't seem easy. So um, it, it, there's, uh, there's some leap of logic that happens. Okay, there's a question on Zoom. Is this the probability that the data is overfitting or is that error on the training data included in this? This is, we're not talking about overfitting here yet. Uh, this is the probability uh, that the uh, hypothesis is perfectly explaining the entire training set or the entire set of M examples. Now, it's, you could call it, 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 it turns out that this represents overfitting. Why? Because it, it is perfectly consistent with M examples, meaning that particular hypothesis is perfectly consistent with M, M examples. And yet, we started off with the assumption that this is a bad hypothesis whose error is more than epsilon. So it's error on those M examples is zero, but it's error, the generalization error is more than epsilon. So the generalization error is bad, whereas the training error on these same examples is zero. So we could call this overfit. Now the question. Capital H is our hypothesis space. It's a set of all functions that exist. It's the set from which little h gets chosen. So this quantity here is just the number of instances in that set, size of H. It's a, this, uh, which, yeah, so I, 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 maybe the, my highlighting has just made things worse, but this is the size of H. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so the, another question is, would we lower M to combat overfitting or am I jumping ahead? Actually, we wouldn't lower M to combat overfitting. Instead, we are going to pull a trick that is rather neat after this. Uh, so let me quickly summarize what we saw because the next trick is really nice. So I cleaned up the proof. I just wanted to, uh, you know, this is the summary of this thing. So the probability that there is a bad hypothesis in our hypothesis space that is that can fool a learner by being consistent with M training examples is less than size of H times one minus epsilon power M. Now, that's a bad situation. Why? Because it's entirely possible that our learner might decide this is the, 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 the output of my learning algorithm. And we want that to not happen. We do not want our learning algorithm to pick that classifier. In other words, if our learning algorithm picked that classifier, then we would count learning as having failed. Why? Because the learner produced a classifier that has high error. So what? So we need, we can ask, what can what do we need to do to make sure that this particular situation is rare? What do we mean by rare? We want to make it improbable. So we want to see. What does it take to make this probability less than delta? We can demand that it's less than delta. So probability that there is a hypothesis H in H that, oh, you know, let's just write it like this. If I have a probability of this quantity, I want that to be less than some delta. If it were less than delta, then with probability one minus delta, learning would succeed. With probability one minus delta, my learner would produce a classifier whose error is small. So I could ask, what do what does it take to make this uh, this uh, this event that uh, there is a bad classifier that might fool a learner? What does it take to make that smaller than delta? Well, we know that the probability of let's just give this whole thing a name. Let's say this is an event E. 
what I just showed above is that the probability of E is less than the size of H times one minus epsilon power M. I want to make E as rare as possible. So I want to make the probability of E less than delta. Well, instead of uh, making the probability of E less than delta, let's make an upper bound of it less than delta. I could ask what, what does it take to make the probability if this quantity is less than delta, then probability E, the probability of E will also be less than delta. Well, uh, I can operate in the log space. I can take log all the way around. And so I get log of H, log of size of H times the, with the log, the M goes to the uh, M comes out. So M times the log of one minus epsilon is less than one, less than the log of delta. What I've done here is if delta were small, if delta were small, that means this quantity is going to be small. Or let's put it this way. If if delta was small, then this quantity is going to be small, which means this probability is going to be small. That means it's very unlikely that our learner will get fooled because of this inequality. Okay. Uh, before we move on, any questions about what we are doing? There's a question on Zoom. Oh, I addressed that. Yeah. That also means that our hypothesis space must be small. Yes, we'll get there. Uh, that's a good observation. Keep that thought in mind. We'll come back to that. In fact, that's why this whole theorem is called Occam's razor. Other uh, thoughts? I'm going to make this a little bit simpler uh, for reasons that I don't fully know. Uh, this expression is often simplified to something else by noting that uh, I can approximate. Um, yeah, I know that e power minus x is going to be is greater than one minus x, so I can take log on both sides, and so I can get so e power minus x is greater than one minus x. I can take log on both sides here. So log of this is greater than log of this. So minus x is greater than log 1 minus x, which means um, log 1 minus x is further upper bounded by minus x. So I can plug that in to this expression here. Instead of log 1 minus epsilon, I can put in minus epsilon to get an even safer bound. So I could just say log of h, log of the size of h minus m epsilon is uh, less than log delta. If so, this is a sequence of steps where each step is saying if the next, uh, if this expression is true, let's just write it this. If this expression is, um, uh, I missed a step. So if this expression is true, then this expression will be true. And if this is true, then this one is going to be true. And if this quantity is true, if this inequality holds, then the probability of a hypothesis being consistent with M examples and having a high error is going to be small. In other words, if let's name these things, if A is true, then if A holds, then B holds, if B holds, then C holds, and if C holds, we are doing well because learning will most likely succeed. And I can, I'm just going to reorganize this expression that I'm calling A, so log size of H, uh, instead of writing it this way, I can write this as the log of the size of H minus M epsilon is less than log delta, but then I can move the M to one side. So I have log, size of h minus log delta is less than m epsilon or m is greater than one over epsilon times minus log delta or equivalently m is greater than one over epsilon the log of the size of h minus 
log of plus the log of one over delta. Yes. How did I, from here, what does that mean? Okay, can you repeat the question? I, the question went away. Okay. Did someone else have a similar question that maybe your unasked question could help? That's right. I take log on both sides. That's right. Now, going to this and this are exactly the same expression. It's just that for reasons I'm for reasons that are easier to interpret, we often see this form here. Um, are these? There's a question. Are these calculations done for each learning algorithm, or, or are they done for each instance of a learning algorithm? Like when you're picking features, or is it more general than that? It's way more general than that. This is not about any learning algorithm. In fact, this is not about any learning algorithm. This is just about the following things. It's about the number of examples you have and the uh, the size of the, the hypothesis space. We never mention a learning algorithm here. This is just saying there could be a learning algorithm, any learning algorithm. If it explores this hypothesis space and you're given M examples, and it turns out that that hypothesis space contains an example that is a hypothesis that's consistent yet bad. What does it take to make that an improbable uh, situation? So we are not talking about any learning algorithm here. In fact, when we apply this bound, we'll be not we'll be dealing with uh, uh, hypothesis spaces and seeing whether they are learnable. So, or rather, we'll be dealing with concept classes and seeing whether they are learnable uh, using some learning learning algorithm. Does there exist a learning algorithm? Could there exist a learning algorithm that can achieve this epsilon delta criterion that pack learnability demands? This is putting a bound. I always confuse lower and upper bound, but this is putting a bound. Uh, uh, if you need, given these many examples, you'll be able to achieve there, must, there can exist a learning algorithm uh, um, to a lower bound without actually talking about what that algorithm is, whether we even know that algorithm, and whether if that algorithm exists, whether it's efficient. So we're not talking about any of those things. All we are saying is from a information point of view, can M examples be pro present enough information to disambiguate between these edge concepts. Is there a question in the back? Okay, there's a question on Zoom. How do you go from the third step uh, uh, in the calculation? I noticed that the, the, I'm gonna redo the, the, so the question is how do I go from, I think here to here or here to here? I noticed that what I have written is rather hideous. So I'm going to redo that um, to be a little bit more clear, um, such as it is. So what we had was log of, let me make sure that I got my signs right. The log of the size of H minus M epsilon is going to be less than log delta. This is where we started. And I'm going to move this quantity here and this quantity here. For that to happen, this becomes plus and this becomes minus. Did I do that wrong? No, both of them become. This is why I should not do math with, uh, yeah. So far, so good. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the problem with doing what I just did is that you can't see the trace. So let me do it more. So this means log of the size of H minus log delta is less than M epsilon. Okay, so let me just rewrite this. Instead of making it a less than, I'll make it a greater than. So I have 
m epsilon is greater than log of size of h minus log delta. I also know that log of x for any x is the same as negative log 1 over x. That's just by definition of the logarithm function. So I can apply that here and I get m epsilon is greater than log size of h plus log 1 over delta because of this property here that will change the color to and make it smaller. Okay, now that means m is greater than 1 over epsilon times log size of h plus Does that answer your question? Cool. I, I, from here to here, there is really nothing particularly smart that's happening. It's just algebra just moving around terms to basically isolate M on one side and everything else on the other side. That's really what I wanted. Uh, uh, there's not much clever arguments happening here. All the cleverness happened uh, right here when I say that I want I want this event E to be rare. And for that, I'm going to upper bound it by some delta, which I don't know yet, but I'm going to, if I make delta small, the event E will be rare. And if I make, instead of making uh, delta small, I'm going to just uh, rewrite it as a different condition that just reorganizes the normal. To put it in a, so if m greater than 1 over epsilon times log 1 over delta, 1 over epsilon times of 1 over epsilon times log of h plus log uh, 1 over delta, then the probability of getting a bad hypothesis is small. There's a question. Yeah? Yes? No, so in fact, what we will, we are not going to make anything smaller or bigger. What we'll say here with the bottom expression is if the number of examples you have is more than this quantity for some epsilon and delta, then the probability of getting a bad hypothesis is small. That's pretty much it. Essentially, we are talking about what I call sample complexity in the previous class. How many examples do you need to make learning successful? So, now that we are thinking about it is if this expression at the bottom of the screen is true, then uh, the, the, the highlighted expression in the middle of the screen holds. So size of H times one minus epsilon power M will be less than delta. But if this thing is small, if that, that, that holds, then it is improbable that we'll have a, any hypothesis that's both consistent and has a higher error. Which means the probability of getting a bad hypothesis, even by accident, is small. In other words, the probability of getting a good hypothesis, good meaning has error more than epsilon, so error less than epsilon, probability of getting such a hypothesis is going to be likely. It's going to be more likely than uh, 1 minus delta. Questions? Questions about this before I talk about interpreting this expression? Yeah, we don't talk about that. This is, this is we are in the world of computational learning theory. We don't talk about learning uh, in a more, uh, you know, how you get it and such things. We are essentially making assumptions that those same examples are obtained IID from a fixed unknown distribution. Beyond that, I don't care. Yes. Some value. From here. Yes. You don't know the true error, but you can demand that the true error has to be small, which means you can plug it into this and you'll, you'll notice that if you do that, then you will need a lot of training examples. 
No, if I want the true error to be small, then I need these many examples. So let's actually talk about that. So I want to rewrite this expression. So let S be any hypothesis space. And this is basically the statement of the Occam's razor theorem, which we've already proved, but I want to state it. Let S be any hypothesis space with probability one minus delta, the, a hypothesis H, little h, that is consistent with a training set of size M will have an error less than epsilon, provided we have M, the number of examples we have is more than this quantity here. If we have if, then if, if we have more examples than what is specified on this bound, then with high probability, probability one minus delta, we will find a class of the we let's say with high probability a classifier that is consistent with your training uh, training examples will have low error. In other words, a classifier that's consistent with your training uh, examples will not overfit by too much. Will not have a, will not, will generalize uh, with error less than epsilon. If we pick, there's a question. If we pick epsilon and delta, uh, we so qu the question is we pick epsilon and delta, right? Meaning we can calculate how many examples we need. That's exactly what uh, this is. If you insist that your classifier should have low error, if I demand that I my classifier that my learner produces whatever the learner might be. The, all we demand, all we expect the learner to do here is to find a hypothesis that is consistent, like your decision tree learner. So if you demand that your decision tree type learner that is consistent with your training set should have an error less than a very, very small epsilon, then it increases the demand that's placed on the, uh, the number of examples. Because if epsilon is small, the this expression becomes bigger, so you need more training examples, which makes sense, right? If you demand that your classifier should be really, really good with in terms of accuracy, then you have to pay more in terms of the training data. If you have a larger hypothesis space, namely size of X is large, that means the number of examples needed is also going to go up. And this is a little bit mysterious. If I demand that my, uh, uh, my error should be small, and that my learner should succeed, then I should make my hypothesis space small. Why? Because we agree that our learner is going to produce a consistent classifier. That means we have a, a, a classifier inside a small search space that is perfectly agreeing with M training examples. Alternatively, we found a classifier in a very large search space that agrees with M training examples. And this theorem says, if you want this, uh, 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 if you if you have the larger training hy uh, hypothesis space and you demand consistency, it might be easier to find accidentally a classifier that agrees with your data. For example, a decision tree of very large depth will probably agree with your training set. But how mysterious, how mysteriously uh, coincidental it might be if your decision tree with a very small depth agrees with a hundred million examples. You don't need 100 million examples to prove that a decision tree of small depth is good. You Even lesser proof is sufficient. How much? This much, these many examples. If your decision tree of small depth agrees with whatever that expression evaluates to, then you, are, uh, uh, you can be guaranteed that with high probability, probability greater than one minus delta, your few, on future examples, the same decision tree will also will have an error less than epsilon. So if you have a larger hypothesis space, learning will get harder. That's the reason this uh, theorem is called Occam's razor. Occam's razor, remember, said prefer simplicity. If you have a simpler set of explanations, like hypotheses, or a complex set of explanations, there are more complex explanations. The, the number of complex explanations is much larger. So if you have a simpler set of explanations versus a complex set of explanations, in order to prove that the complex explanation is correct or is good enough with low error, you need a lot more training data. So if you have a lesser amount of training data, you should prefer smaller explanations. If you, the third term in terms of delta, if you want high confidence that your learner learning will succeed. In other words, if you want high confidence that 
your uh, classifier that you produce will have low error, then we have a term that, uh, the, that, is, that varies as one over delta. One over delta means that as delta increases, this whole expression goes up. If you demand high confidence in the output of your learner, no matter what that learner might be, as long as it's consistent, then you need more training examples. If you want more accuracy, you need more training examples. If you want more confidence in your learning, the success of your learning, you need more training examples. If you want to explore a larger hypothesis space, you need more training examples. That's what this expression tells us. Questions about this? Yes. Talking about like decision fatigue, but like, for example, our homework, our decision fatigue were like 92% accurate. On, the, on future examples, on the training data, it was perfect. Yeah, but like depth limit. Depth limit, yes, that's right. So how would this, is it reasonable to keep the type of things in like, oh, instead of game logs, can change it? For examples that aren't specifically. Right. So the question was, how would this work if this condition of consistency is not met? How would, how would this work if your learner is not consistent with your training data? That setting is called agnostic learning. And that will be the first thing that we'll encounter after the break. Yes. No, so delta is the probability that your classifier fails. One minus delta is the probability that your classifier, the, the, not classifier, sorry, your learning, delta is the probability that your learning fails. Your learning for produces a classif bad classifier. You need smaller data. For, for high confidence in your learner's success, you need a smaller delta. Other questions? This is the first of a set of theorems that we'll call Occam's razor. We'll see a similar theorem. We'll actually go over the proof of another theorem called Occam's razor for the setting where uh, the learner does not get 100% uh, training accuracy. And that is uh, for agnostic learning. But this one is for uh, uh, the, the case where we have a consistent learner. It's called Occam's razor because it expresses this preference towards a smaller hypothesis spaces. Given a larger hypothesis space and a smaller hypothesis space, it is better to choose a smaller hypothesis space simply because this quantity goes down and so you can you can kind of reduce your epsilon and delta because that quantity has gone down. Given a set of training examples, you can make your epsilon and delta smaller than it is. And that way learning might succeed. The learning might produce a better, um, a more accurate classifier, for example, provided it's consistent. What it shows is that uh, it shows this, uh, 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 it shows a condition for when an M consistent hypothesis, that's just a, a shorthand that I've used to denote the fact that you have a hypothesis that's consistent with M training examples. This shows the conditions that uh, uh, for when an M consistent hypothesis will generalize well. By, and by generalize well, I mean it has an error less than epsilon. We have ne we've given up this hope that uh, the error will be zero, future error. Maybe there may be a future error, uh, some future error, but we are just saying it should be less than some epsilon. What it says is that, uh, uh, yes. Infinite hypothesis spaces are terrible. And yet, sometimes they work, and that's one of the mysteries. That's the last point here. It does not, this. This statement does not necessarily say that a larger hypothesis space is necessarily bad. All it says is that smaller hypothesis spaces are less likely to fool us by being consistent with a large number of examples. It does not say that bad, larger hypothesis spaces are bad. It only says that do not pick, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if a small hypothesis space is consistent with uh, a training set, then it's less likely that that function that you've chosen from that small hypothesis space is going to be bad. Does that, so it's, it's a one-sided thing. 
other questions or, or comments? So there are, here is a sort of a scheme for um, pack learning based on that, uh, the, the, the theorem that we just saw. We've talked, so far I've not talked about any learning algorithm or anything. All I said is I want some learning algorithm that's consistent with your training, uh, that produces a classifier that's consistent with your training data. So what we can do is uh, if you're given M examples, you pick a hypothesis space uh, you pick some function x, little x, that's consistent with your entire training data. And then with your, you pick your epsilon and delta, uh, uh, or you, you basically check whether this expression holds for your the set of functions you consider. If that quantity here, the right-hand side that I've highlighted, is not too large. In other words, if it's only polynomial in, the, in one over epsilon and one over delta, and the dimensionality, then we would count learning as succeed, succeed, having succeeded. In other words, that particular hypothesis space would be pack learnable according to the definition of pack learning because the number of examples needed is going to be a polynomial in one over epsilon, one over delta, the size of H. Well, we have not talked about the dimensionality and that's the thing that we have to worry about next. Of course, it's not sufficient to say that uh, this is pack learnable. If your learning algorithm cannot explore that hypothesis space in an efficient way, then there's no hope. So we need to also invent a new algorithm that actually does that search for you. But that's a different question. We have not talked about uh, an actual algorithm that you can implement. This is just a general recipe. I'm going to kind of end this part, this subunit here with a set of exercises. Um, so, I want you to think about whether decision trees are pack learnable. If you have n binary features, the only thing that really matters is this quantity here, the size of x. So, you really need to count how many decision trees exist if you have n features and think about whether they are pack learnable. And you can apply the same questions for uh, uh, conjunctions, disjunctions, and so on, and also for Think about efficiency. I'm going to not. I'm not going to discuss these questions uh, right now because that's going to be the basis of literally the next thing that we'll do. In particular, I'll talk about conjunctions being pack learnable uh, and talk, tell you why. So I say I'm going to answer this question for you right now, which takes us to a set of positive and negative learnability results that we can immediately tell from this uh, Occam's razor theorem. Where we are is we're talking about the theory of generalization. We've just looked at the definition of pack learning, and we've seen one theorem called Occam's razor for a consistent learner. We can now use that theorem and say certain classes of functions cannot be learned under this pack scheme, and certain other classes of functions are learnable under this pack scheme. The first one is that general conjunctions are pack learnable. This is uh, what, uh, what I'm going to work through now is like the general uh, sort of a scheme for how this theorem might be used for any set of functions. Consider the func set of functions that are general, conjunct general conjunctions. So we have uh, a function that has all these things and uh, uh, variables or negations, and they can be, uh, you can join them with this and here. How many general conjunctions are there? And I say general conjunctions, usually I just say conjunctions. Uh, and the point is negations are allowed. How many conjunctions exist? If this is the set capital H, what's the size of H? We've seen this before. I think we've seen this before. It's three power N. Why? That's right. So you can have, you, you if you have n variables, you can construct this object with n slots. And the first position can have the variable x1, 
It can have the negated variable x1, or it could just have a true. Second one can have an x2, negated x2, or true, and so on. It can have xn, negate not xn, or true. Each slot has three options, and these three options can be picked independent of each other to construct a unique conjunction. And so there are three power n possible conjunctions. So the log of size of x is n times log three. Immediately, we can plug this into this expression here. That means the number of examples needed is 1 over epsilon, which just carries over times the size of x, which is n log 3, the well, log of the size of x, which is n log 3, times plus log of 1 over delta, which we just carry over from here. What this says is, if we have these many examples, then we can learn a conjunction efficiently not efficiently, we can learn a conjunction that agrees with uh, uh, your training set and it will generalize well in the future. It will make error at one minus with high probability, with probability one minus delta, it will make an, it will have an error less than epsilon. What, let's kind of interpret this result a little bit. But before we do that, notice that this right hand side is polynomial is some polynomial in one over epsilon, in the dimensionality, in one over delta, I managed to get rid of the size of the hypothesis space. So the number of examples needed is a polynomial in these expressions. Logarithm is less than polynomial. So we are good. So the number of examples needed is uh, less than, uh, is a polynomial in all these complexity parameters needed for what? To guarantee that we, with high probability, we'll have a low error. In other words, this satisfies the conditions that the pack learning definition demanded. In other words, general conjunctions are pack learnable. If you want to interpret this a little bit, suppose you want to guarantee a 95% chance that a hypothesis uh, or a 95% chance of learning a, a, a hypothesis of accuracy at least 90. That means this tells you that one minus delta is 0.95 and epsilon is 0.9. If you have 10 Boolean variables, then we need, we can just plug this into this whole thing and we, it says, if you have 140 examples, then uh, any conjunction that perfectly agrees with all 140 examples will have an error less than 90% or more than, nine, uh, sorry, accuracy more than 90%. But sometimes you might just get fooled by a bad set of 140 examples. So instead of saying you're always guaranteed that the error will be uh, less than, this is epsilon is 0 0.1, sorry. The error will be less than 0 0.1. With high probability, the error will be less than 0 0.1. So the, we, we, the, there's a 95% chance that your error will be less than 0.1. If let's say instead of uh, 10 variables, if the, uh, the dimensionality increases to 100%, 100, then this expression M goes up to uh, about 1000. So it increases linearly in the dimensionality. If you, uh, uh, you know, if you change epsilon uh, or delta appropriately, if you decrease both of them, the number of examples needed will also still go up. And these results hold for any consistent learner. I've not talked about which learning algorithm to use. This applies for any learning algorithm that is consistent. Increasing the confidence from 95 to 99 will uh, increase the number of examples uh, from here to this much. So it only increases logarithmically in the, uh, in the delta. So the, here the delta is 0.05. And here, delta is 0 0.01. Questions before we talk about another set of functions. Ah, there's a question on uh, Zoom. Is there a proof of a similar sort with similar guarantees, such as the size of M, if we want to check if a concept class is efficiently pack learnable? I don't think so. Efficient pack learnability is kind of a, efficiency is a computational complexity question. A proof of computational complexity typically involves proving that some 
some problem can be solved in polynomial time. And that's the kind of question that you might deal with in an algorithms class. Can some problem be solved in a, uh, in a polynomial time? And some problems cannot. And to, or you can you show a reduction with respect to some sort of a known NP complete problem, for instance. Did you have a question? Uh, you, uh, there were three questions. I saw your hand first. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's a great question. So that, that, that's a very good question because I want to kind of spend a bit of time on that. Imagine that the learning algorithm that uh, uh, Prashant, right? Yeah, that Prashant has invented is the following. You have, uh, I take your data set uh, and I put it in a database. If a new example comes in, I check if the database contains the example, I just return the label that was already there. If the database does not contain the example, I just return a random label, right? That's your algorithm. It's not a great algorithm, but it's one. It, it is an algorithm, right? And one important property that the algorithm has is that it's consistent with the M training example, because any example that has already been seen will be in the database. So it will be, it will get the right label. So the question is, is that algorithm considered to be good for this uh, sort of a problem? The answer is yes, provided that algorithm is uh, your, your future examples will also look like this. Your future examples, if they also satisfy a similar distribution, then it's unlikely that you will see examples that are, it's rare that you'll see examples that are outside. That's one. The second thing to think about is this particular uh, hypothesis that you constructed, your learning algorithm builds a hypothesis, right? What is the number of hypotheses that exist for that? Number of unique hypotheses, assuming even that the, the, we are dealing with a set of, the hypothesis is simply a set of examples, right? The number of unique hypotheses is the number of unique sets of examples, which is a humongous number. So where this will hurt is the size of H. The size of H is going to be is going to hit you in this expression. The other terms don't matter. So your hypothesis space is really large. You will memorize any training data, but unfortunately, your the, the log of the size of the hypothesis space is going to be the log of the number of sets of unique examples, which is going to be really large. So that means in order to attain this guarantee, you'll have to get have a large number of examples. So there is. Uh, I like how you set it up as a loophole, but it's not because the complexity of the hypothesis space comes into play here. Yes. That's literally what it means. It is unbelievable. I like the fact that you say it's unbelievable because that means that something in this class is really new and cool. So I find I feel happy about that. Um, but it is. That's that's literally what it means. It means that the set of conjunctions is just sort of a really tight set, and it's very unlikely that you might accidentally find a conjunction that agrees with how many thousand twenty nine examples, and yet disagrees with future, provided the conjunction is fixed and the distribution is fixed. That's what it means, the distribution over training examples. Other questions? Yes. So if you have a simpler problem, let's say you have a simpler problem, 
Okay. What does a simpler problem mean? It means uh, my current definition of a simpler problem is the function that we are trying to learn is a simpler function. How many simpler functions exist? Uh, and that's it's definitely less than the number of more complex functions or more complicated functions, right? So the set of more complicated functions contains functions that are probably simple and not. So you might accidentally find a very, very complex function that agrees with your data. Now that complicated function may not be the true function, may disagree with future examples. It's easier to find a complicated example that agrees with your data. Think of your decision tree learner, for instance. If you have a data set, it's easier to find, I say it's easy, given any data set, if you run the ID3 algorithm, as long as the data set is, uh, does not have any inconsistencies, you will find a tree that agrees with the data. Not only will it agree with the data, it will agree with the noise. On the other hand, imagine that you had a, uh, uh, so let's say you found a tree with of depth 500 that agrees with your data set. Let's say you have a million features. Say you found a tree of depth 500 that perfectly agrees with all your training examples. Now let's say I have a tree of depth three that also agrees with all the training examples. Which one is more likely to be the real function? It's possible that nature used the 500 uh, thing. But wouldn't it, isn't it a remarkable surprise if a tree of depth three agrees with all the examples? Then maybe the smaller, how many trees of depth three exist versus how many trees of depth 500 exist? I have considered a small hypothesis space and found a function that agrees with a larger data set. It's going to be a remarkable coincidence if this was not the true function. That's essentially what this is saying. Doesn't mean that nature's functions are all simple. But it was, what this says is, in order to prefer a large function, in order to prefer a more complex explanation, you must demand a larger evidence in the form of more training examples. And that's what we get here because of this, uh, this log dependency here. There's another question on Zoom. How do you calculate um, the size of H for more complex concept classes like the ones we see in NLP or image processing, is that feasible to do? Um, I'll give you a short answer now, and then we'll come back to this answer later. The short answer is most of the complex, uh, I, I'm trying to avoid using the word complex because complex might involve complex numbers, complicated concept classes that we see in NLP or uh, machine learning uh, or uh, computer vision and such things, they tend to involve real numbers. They tend to involve, uh, uh, infinite hypothesis spaces, where we need to invent a new theory called VC theory, uh, which we will uh, encounter much later. And the this it's not going to be the size of the hypothesis space, but something called the VC dimension that's going to be the complexity parameter. And we'll get to that later. Uh, it is feasible to do. It gets really hard with the more complicated uh, uh, models that we encounter in real life. And this becomes like a nice exercise for people who do theory to play with. Okay, we have about six minutes left. So I think we can go do one more set of functions, okay? Unless we have questions. Actually, two more sets of functions. Another set of functions is something called 3CNF. How many people have seen CNF before? At least some hands are not raised. So I will, CNF is something called a conjunctive Normal form. C and F. And it's it's a, a Boolean expression consisting of uh, a bunch of uh, conjuncts. These are called conjuncts here. A conjunct is just something that is a, list, a set of literals that are connected by an or. And then each all these conjuncts are then connected by an and. So so you have a or B and not A and not C. So we have, these are all called conjuncts and then we are connecting them with an I. So this is a conjunctive normal form. A 3CNF is a specific kind of a conjunct where 
a, a CNF where every conjunct, which is these things here, can have at most three literals. So you can have no more than three things that are in, inside the brackets here that are connected by an all. Set of functions. I'm not saying it's a set of functions that you're going to encounter every day, uh, but you know it's good for these kinds of exercises. In order to apply uh, the sort of uh, analysis that we are doing, the only thing we need to do is count the size of the hypothesis space. In other words, what we need is uh, just to, ca uh, to calculate how many three CNFs exist. Let's take a step back. The question that typically, the, the way this question tends to be posed is, what is the sample complexity for learning a three CNF in the consistent setting? In other words, if we had a consistent learner, how many examples will it take to guarantee pack learnability if our learner was uh, exploring a, uh, the set of three CNFs? Or if our true concept belongs to the set of three CNFs. All we need is the set size of this uh, hypothesis space. So we need to find how many three CNFs there are. Any ideas on how we might attack this? Is it a finite set, first of all? It's a finite set. Here's how you do it. Let's not worry about three CNFs. Let's first find how many unique three disjunctions can exist. This is a three disjunction. So we have um, three slots. And in each slot, I can put a, va a variable or its negation. But because we are saying at most, we can also have the false here. Basically, that variable does not exist. Now, if I put x1 here, I cannot put x1 again. So I can I need to put a different variable, maybe x14 or not x14, or I can just leave that slot empty. I have a third slot, I can still do the same thing. I can put x99. Any ideas on how many such uh three disjunctions? Yes. One answer is three power and minus one like this, or minus one here, uh, this one. You're, I'm assuming you're saying minus one because the false, let's pretend that doesn't matter. So your answer is really order of three power n. Other, any other answers? I'm going to suggest that there's, it's extremely a big overestimate. So there's a much smaller number. Yes. Two n plus one cube. Uh, this is closer to the right answer. It's in fact, as far as I'm concerned, it is the right answer. So let me explain why. We have three slots, right? I'm going to do a very very loose sort of a uh, loose sort of math here because all I need is order of magnitude. So. In the first slot, I can have one of the n variables. I have n things that I can put in there. Or I can have a negation of the n variables. So another n. So that's two n. I'm going to pretend that all false, it goes away, just like you did at the back. Um, so I can put two n things here. Once I've chosen those two n things, let's say I choose, choose x1. I'm not allowed to use x1 again. I'm not allowed to use not x1 again, right? Which means out of the two n things that I had, two n could be a variable or its negation, two things are gone. So I can put two n minus two here. So maybe I chose x14 or not x14, doesn't matter. Let's say I chose, I used up x14. So I've used up x1, I've used up x14. Out of the n variables, I've used up x1, I've used up x14, and also it negations because I'm not allowed to use them. So I have 2n minus four things here. And these things can all be done. So the, the, the number of possibilities is 2n times 2n minus two times 2n minus four. I see we are a minute over time. Uh, there's also a suggestion that the answer is nine, but no, it is order of 
to an view. We are out of time, and uh, maybe in the next lecture uh, for the review. Before I do the review, I'll just finish this thing. Uh, I got it all carried away with this and didn't notice that we are a minute over time. So the next lecture, I'll for most of the part, the next lecture is going to be review. Just a little bit of this will be wrapped up. And since we haven't finished this thing, I encourage you to kind of think about the answer to this question and you can come back with the answer. <laughs>